Listen, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here for the 2023 Thesis in Three competition. For people who don't know me, my name is Norley Kennedy. I'm the Vice President for Research for the University of Limerick. And this is genuinely one of the highlight events of the year. And for people who haven't been here um, at one of these before, you will know what I mean um, after the next two hours are over. Um, you're in for a real treat. It is just fantastic, the calibre of research that is happening among our PhD student cohort. And I know there's been lots of heats up to this point, and I'd like to congratulate everybody who's been involved in the process and to wish the very best of luck to all of our um, people attending here today and participating here this evening. Uh, just so, you know, one other thing I want to say before I finish, because I know I'm really going to be taking up time from the main act. I unfortunately can't attend any of the Research Week events tomorrow um, because unfortunately other things are in my diary. However, I would like to take the opportunity to again thank the phenomenal team in the office of the Vice President for Research who are behind all of this week's events and also to acknowledge the Doctoral College um, colleagues who are behind this evening's event. Um, you know, they are an incredible team of people. They do this on top of everything else that they do and they do it with gusto and with spirit because they absolutely love what happens during research week which is the energy and the opportunity to showcase all that is good that is happening across the university so i just want to make that that note today so um i'll hand over then to anne and and Ger and colleagues who are going to do all of the pragmatics of the event and i'm looking forward to this evening and congratulations in advance to everybody thank you Um, hi folks, for those that don't know me, uh, my name is Anne McPhail and I'm the, uh, recently, I can't keep saying recently, Fe February, uh, February appointment as the Associate Vice President for Doctoral College. Um, I don't want to take time up and away from the main presenters this evening in talking about the Doctoral College, but there is a Doctoral College launch that will be hopefully within the next four or five weeks and that will be an opportunity for you to hear more about the Doctoral College, what we're about, um, and who's at the centre of that and the support services that will be part, part of that. Um, I think in talking with PGR's postgraduate researchers um, since February or, or throughout um, my career, one of the things that keeps coming up is this notion of networking. And postgraduate researchers are sometimes feeling isolated and not part of a community. And I think the two events that we actually are going to celebrate this evening do that. They've provided a network and a professional research network for people from across the picture of this and the Thesis in Three um, competition. We're going to run, first of all, with the Thesis in Three. Um, and what we'll do there is we have 12 finalists. So three finalists came through each of the four faculty heats. And those 12 people will, will present to us um, this evening. We're then going to take a break. And then when we come back, we'll look at the picture of this um, event and competition along with the thesis in three. And to remind you, the picture of this was an opportunity for people to choose an image and a caption for that image. They then um, uh, posted it on social media. We then had an, a competition in relation to the number of likes that, that the caption and the picture had. And we then took 10 finalists from those. And the 10 finalists are actually posted in the corridor behind the room that we're in at the moment. So judging has been done for that, so we will announce the winner uh, or the competition uh, after a break, as well as the thesis in three uh, final. So we're going to go through the 12 presentations for thesis in three. Last year we did the name and the title in introducing each person, but they do that themselves. So I will retire and sit with yourselves, uh, enjoy the 12 presentations, and then we will allow maybe 15, 20 minutes for our three judges um, who will need that time, believe you me, um, to determine who are the, the top three uh, performers from the thesis in three. So if we can start, we'll ask our first speaker to the stage. They have three minutes. They will be taken off by different means if they don't go, if they go over the three minutes. <laughs> <coughs> I'm Scottish, so I'm used to that. Um, um, I wish you all well. Um, as Nori Lee said, it is the highly, highlight of the week. And it's actually, last year, I think I was actually, in, I was so humbled by the performances, absolutely humbled. Um, and um, I challenge you not to be humbled by what you, what you hear this evening. So if we can, uh, if we can get started and please introduce all of our presenters, but first off, our very first presenter. Thank you. Um, okay, 
sorry, first time using this. Um, good evening. My name is Aidan Buffy. I'm a fourth year structured PhD in the Department of Physical Education and Sports Science and the Health Research Institute. And today, my presentation is on Chain to Our Desks How Do We Break Free, Improve Our Health, a co designed workplace health promotion initiative. Thank you. So, administrative jobs are the third largest occupation in Ireland and saw a 25% increase from 2011 to 2016, the largest of any occupation in Ireland. Unfortunately, administrative jobs are associated with prolonged sitting during the working day as it's important to recognise the detrimental effects sitting has on our health and well-being. Studies have shown that prolonged sitting is associated with an increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, and some cancers. Globally, one in four adults do not meet the recommended physical activity guidelines. But here's the thing. Meeting the 150 minutes of physical activity per week is not enough to reduce the negative impact of sitting on our health, even when we exercise regularly. So, how can we combat the harmful effects of sitting? My research investigates interrupting prolonged sitting with physical activity breaks. Specifically, I have looked at standing and light intensity walking on markers of health such as glucose and insulin, and the findings are promising. I have found that short, frequent physical activity breaks significantly improve markers of health such as glucose and insulin. My research focuses on administrative staff as I have shown that these workers can sit for an incredible 78% of their working day or six hours a day. Building on these findings, I wanted to investigate the feasibility of incorporating light walking into the working day to promote physical activity and to reduce sitting in a real life setting. To do this and to increase the relevance, acceptability, and feasibility of the study, I took a participatory research approach and co-designed this study with Universal Hospital Limerick and relevant stakeholders and end users, those being the administrative staff. The result? A co-designed, multi-component workplace health promotion initiative that targeted at the individual level breaking sitting every 40 minutes with three minutes of light walking. This equates to 12 breaks for an eight-hour workday or 36 minutes of sitting replaced with physical activity. Whether the physical activity is light or moderate to vigorous, the reduction in sitting is clinically meaningful. This study is ongoing, and upon completion, it is our hope to roll out this initiative via Healthy Island across the HSC organization, the largest employer in Ireland, into workplace health and well-being policy. So, if you take anything from today, it is to be conscious of your sitting time and how you too could break your sitting to improve your health. Thank you. Okay. My name is Lydia from the Kemi Business School, and my work is about the relevance of guiding employees in the transition towards corporate sustainability. We are all only too aware of the global climate crisis and the need for urgent action to prevent an irreversible damage to the planet. Just in case we were in doubt, the current energy crisis has brought us back to reality, calling for sustainable, green actions in every aspect of our lives. In this context, the European Green Deal is playing a crucial role by driving the European Union countries' commitment to become a climate-neutral continent by 2050. A spoiler alert, we are running late. Let's be realistic. This is an ambitious objective, and we will need the support of firms, and most importantly, of workers to achieve it. 
That's why my research highlights the area of human resource management as a corporate solution to drive firms' sustainable performance. More specifically, I have delved into the novel concept of green human resource management, which includes a bundle of practices designed to improve employees' eco-friendly behaviors. Thanks to both my quantitative and qualitative research, I have been able to prove the effectiveness of these practices in driving employees' empowerment and commitment to the environment and in establishing flexible workplaces where workers can voice their innovative solutions towards the conservation of ecosystems, social equity and well-being. In fact, based on my sample of 308 Spanish hospitality workers, I found out that more than 60% of them are willing to undertake eco-initiatives when receiving green human resource management practices. Do you know that multiple advantages can be derived from green human resource management implementation? Yes, from higher levels of employee satisfaction to improvements in firms efficiency, environmental performance, and innovation. Through my research, I have developed some useful guidelines to help firms in the process of preparing employees to proactively address environmental issues. I really hope my findings help us to overcome the delay in becoming environmentally sustainable. Thank you very much for your attention. everyone, a very warm evening. My name is Gauri Vaidya, a second year postgrad at Department of Computer Science and Information Systems, and today I will be talking to you about integration of cancer data. I want you all to look at this picture for a moment and think about what first comes to your mind. Hmm, you must have thought a girl is looking at something. Well, you're right, but let me give you some more clues about this picture. The place where the girl is standing is called Living Bridge, one of the beautiful places in Limerick. If you observe the weather behind the girl, and if you know Ireland very well, you will agree with me that this is one of the kindest days in Ireland. And finally, the girl in the picture is me, Gauri. Now, if you rethink what you know about the picture, your sentence must have changed to Gauri enjoying one of the beautiful and brighter days in Ireland, isn't it? The journey from the first sentence to the second sentence was not only the sources of information I gave you, but more importantly, the contextual connectedness between them, which we, with our human brains, can do. Such contextual connectedness is very crucial in clinical decision making, specifically for diseases such as cancer. In order to recommend a personalized treatment plan to a cancer patient, a clinician takes into account every minute detail of that patient. However, one of the recent studies by IBM shows that if the treatment is delayed by four weeks, for every four-week delay, there is an increase of death factor by six to eight percent, which is huge. So what can we do to accelerate these treatment planning processes? That's the objective of my research, to develop an integrated digital patient profile that would give the clinician a holistic view of that patient data. In order to do this, I have divided my research into two broader phases. In phase one, which I'm currently in, I'm integrating this patient data with the language structure in order to connect a contextual relationship between them. In the second and final stage of my research, I would be training these models, making them more smarter, so that they can also understand and resonate the information just we as human beings could do in the first picture. For instance, my model would be able to answer what treatment would be suitable for a patient of lung cancer in stage two. More importantly, it would also be able to answer why that treatment is suitable for that patient over other treatments, assisting the clinicians in giving the best recommendations for that patient. Moving forward, not only for cancer, but when we all confront illness, we need personalized treatment plans at certain areas of life. My treatment, 
my research would enable the production of these plants, accelerating treatments, and hopefully saving lives. Thank you. So good evening everyone, my name is Iman Dessa and I'm from the School of Modern Languages and Applied Linguistics. Well, the topic of my PhD research revolves around enhancing international students' pragmatic competence through the use of formulaic language. Well, personally, as an international Algerian student, and I'm quite sure that many of my colleagues who are here as international students as well, would share with me our first experience of not understanding the Irish people when they talk. So, since my arrival here in Ireland, and I, uh, from starting from the airport gates and on, I was like, is this the English that you and I know? Are we really in an English-speaking country? Especially when you hear those commonly used expressions for greetings, such as in scale, uh, or uh, in Craig, or what's the story? And I was like wondering, do I need to have a story to start a conversation with someone? <laughs> so, all these kind of uh, expressions fall under the term formulaic language, such as idioms and conventional expressions. So these patterns are uh, stored in the long-term memory and then recalled by a naturally occurring pragmatic context in order to be appropriately produced by a foreign language learner, and failure to do so may result in the stereotype that foreign language learners might be rude or inconsiderate. Hence, second language speakers has to expand identity as they learn the social and the cultural parameters in order to speak appropriately with a new voice and click with people from the target culture community. So, therefore, my study is interested in investigating how, how can formulaic language uh, acquisition improve international students' pragmatic competence. So, in order uh, in, in order to do so, and answering the question, how can formulaic language um, fulfill certain speech acts that are germane to natives or native speakers, there is uh, the uh, sketch engine, the software sketch engine, where I have analyzed the uh, data, collected data from a spoken corpus from an EFL international class here at UL, where the students could display multicultural and multilingual facets. In other words, it is indeed a fertile field for research. So the preliminary results from the sketch engine analysis has proved that there is a direct impact of formulaic language acquisition on international students' pragmatic and interactional dynamics. And thank you for your kind listening. Good evening. I'm Patrick, representing the Faculty of Education and Health Sciences and Department of Physical Education and Sports Science. Tonight, I will be discussing with you the landscape where there's thousands of resources for a few dozen players, yet thousands of players have no resources. So who would have thought a country with only 5 million people defeating countries with populations of 60 and 70 million? Any guess what I'm talking about? Ireland, your Six Nations champions and number one rugby team in the world. The hard work put in during a rugby match is undeniable. The willingness of players to lay their bodies on the line for their team, for their country, that's a sense of pride we spectators love to feel. But win or lose, the result is a product of much more than those 80 minutes alone. Specialists work around the clock to prepare players for the brutal demands of the game. These physiotherapists and strength and conditioning coaches use a wide array of resources to help players perform their best while reducing their risk of injury. But what about the rest of us? What do we have access to? What about the moms and dads who want to continue to play the sport they love, hold down a full-time job, and still be able to keep up with the little ones at home? 
the number of us participating in community sport is far greater than those at the professional level. Yet with the complete imbalance of resources, these injuries are impacting our daily lives. Nowadays, I wear a researcher's coat, but for the last 10 years, I've worn my coaching hat. So I'm determined to do something about this. Community rugby here in Ireland has reported higher overall injury rates compared to similar cohorts internationally. But I needed to know what types of injuries were occurring. So I went out and monitored injuries in 25 clubs across the country and discovered what parts of the body were most susceptible to injury. So there was clearly room for improvement, but what resources were available in the community? Well, after interviewing players and coaches at this level, I had the key insights necessary to design not only a feasible intervention, but one they'd actually want to use. It was time to put my practical skills to the test. I designed a program to be completed in less than 15 minutes, does not use equipment, and does not require expert, often expensive, consultation of physios. In an eight-month nationwide control trial, I implemented this program in 21 men's and women's clubs across the country, and we found incredible results. The clubs that use this program compared to those that didn't found 30, saw 32% less severe injuries, 42% less non-contact injuries, those all too common knee ligament and shoulder sprains, 60% less, and 77% fewer hamstring strains. Now the most important finding was that the clubs found the program enjoyable and easy to implement, with compliance playing a huge role in these positive clinical outcomes. So whether you play rugby, your kids play soccer, or you coach a GAA team, I encourage you to engage with Engage. Thank you for listening. Hi everyone, my name is Mei Li from the Department of Chemical Sciences. Today I'm going to talk about the post lithium ion battery as a special burger for the robots. In the last few years, we have gone through the pandemic, fires and earthquake. We as humans are vulnerable, not to mention those working at the front line, doctors, nurses, firemen and rescue teams. They risk their lives to save others. So what can we do for them? Here comes the autonomous mobile robot. They are designed to be able to walk at the front line instead of us. The market size of AMR is increasing and more than half of this industry will be within Europe in 2030. We have got the charging, firefighting and detecting robots. However, these guys here will fall asleep as soon as they run out of energy. Just like we crave food that gives us energy like a burger when we are hungry. I am designing a special burger for them so what kind of battery or what kind of robots do you think we can offer our robot bodies? My project is designing the post lithium ion batteries for the robot. We optimize them by preparing nanomaterials and testing their charge and discharge behaviors. The structure of the battery is like a beef burger and silicon is the main protein that provides energy to this battery. The nanostructure silicon can bind with more lithium ions that are traveling between the cathode and anode, which keeps the energy inside during charging and creates the current to the external circuit when discharged. Our group at Burnout Institute, we are capable of synthesizing the silicon nanowires as tiny as 40 nanometers to improve the texture of this burger, make it juicy and tasty. And after our tests, we find that the specific capacity of silicon nanowires is five times higher than the commercial graphite etno, which means higher energy density and fewer charging hours compared to our laptops and phones. So far, we have both a technical white paper for the industry and a research review paper published last year. In the coming future, both AMRs and EVs are required batteries with longer lifetimes, higher energy, and lower cost. As you may notice, almost everything surrounding us in our daily life is becoming electrified and autonomous. And they will get involved with machine learning, battery management, and recycling systems as well. Now we got to know 
we as humans are vulnerable, but we are strong. We will work together, develop the new generation batteries, figure out the energy crisis, and we believe this Silicon Burger will be the game changer in the near future. Thank you. Uh, so good afternoon, my name is Keila McMahon and I'm a second year PhD student here in the Kemi Business School. And my presentation today is about ESG and attempts to quantify corporate social responsibility. So investors are becoming increasingly conscious of the impact that their investments can have on the world and sustainably minded institutions like UL are wondering where they should invest their money. And ESG has been developed to assist them. So ESG is the use of non-financial factors in evaluating invest investment opportunities. And these factors are separated into the three pillars of environmental, social, and corporate governance. So every company is scored in these pillars, and those scores are aggregated to get your overall ESG score. So the first thing you have to decide when you're constructing an ESG score is what sub-factors to take into consideration within the three pillars. And this decision, along with many other subjective ESG considerations, are currently being decided by just a handful of rating agencies. And these rating agencies often provide conflicting scores for the same company. Bank of America, for example, has two completely different scores from two leading rating providers. And what's more, these rating providers don't even provide the methodology through which these scores are derived. So that's where I come in. The initial part of my research involves reverse engineering the ESG scores, using the vast amounts of sustainability data available in the Bloomberg terminal here in the Kemi Business School. And what I've found so far is that ESG is correlated with a number of factors that have nothing to do with sustainability. For example, large companies tend to have strong ESG scores, which leads to truly bizarre results, such as tobacco companies having higher than average ESG scores simply because they are larger companies. And what's more, a lot of the rating providers are fundamentally flawed in their methodology, in that they don't actually measure the impact that the company has on the environment and on society and on the world. But rather, they measure the impact a deteriorating world could have on the finances of a company. So for example, if a company decided to build a carbon emitting factory at a high altitude, it's often looked on favorably by the ESG rating providers simply because that factory won't be exposed to rising sea level risks, even though it's contributing to them. So where do we go from here? Um, so you mightn't tell with the suit, but I am uh, an organic farmer in the Burren, and there we practice sustainability every day. So to give just one example, uh, we make sure each field is grazed just enough to allow these wildflowers to grow again every spring. So to me, the idea that sustainability can be quantified into numbers on a spreadsheet is an idea that exists only in the mind of someone who's never walked these limestone pavements. So what I hope to do with my research is to reimagine ESG so that it serves the interests of everybody. By taking information from investors and sustainability data from the Bloomberg Terminal, I hope to construct in individual specific ESG scores, acknowledging that concepts of sustainability are not the same for every investor. And in doing this, I hope to ensure that investors are confident that their investments are contributing positively to the world around them in a way that most accurately reflects their values. Thank you for listening. Uh, good evening. My name is Aled Dimbotomin. I'm a third year PhD student at the Department of Sociology. And today I'll be talking to you about the discourse of the Fine Gael government on undocumented migrants in the era of Trump and Brexit. So during the second half of the last decade, it looked like a wave of right-wing populism was sweeping through the United States and many European nations. From the Trump presidency to the Brexit vote 
to the increase in popularity of far-right parties in countries like France and Italy, the rhetoric of right-wing nationalist leaders seemed to resonate with millions of voters. Now, the discourse of politicians like Trump or Le Pen, although unconventional and controversial in many ways, was especially hostile to mo towards migrants and ethnic minorities, as these examples show us. I was curious about how the rise of right-wing populism internationally could potentially affect the migration debate in the Irish context. And so what my research essentially centered around was looking at the parliamentary discourse of the Irish government on the subject of undocumented migration. Uh, so applying one of the most widely used methods of critical discourse analysis by Norman Fairclough, and with the help of a software for qualitative data analysis called MVivo, I looked in depth into 13 parliamentary texts dealing with the topic of undocumented non-EU immigration from 2016 to 2020, all produced by the head of the Irish government, uh, the Taoiseach. And you can only imagine how I butchered the pronunciation of this word first time I learned it. Uh, so one of the first things I learned from my research is how heavily informed Irish government discourse is by EU discourse and EU perspective, as the Taoiseach frequently cited them as sources. Moreover, by relying almost entirely on declarative mood statements, uh, assertive speech acts and polar sentences that either deny or affirm something with absolute certainty, the government tried to lend authority and reliability to its narrative. And finally, while third-person pronouns, they, them, and their, were used only four times to refer to EU partners, they were used a total of 32 times to refer to undocumented migrants. On the other hand, first-person pronouns, we, us, our, were used 25 times to refer to the EU and larger European community, and not even once to refer to and include undocumented migrants, indicating a clear linguistic pattern of othering and dismissal of these migrants' perspective. I suppose I also learned that the significance of a research like this is to demonstrate the importance of challenging official and dominant narratives and showing how they can implicitly other and exclude migrant communities. Thank you for listening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Anne-Marie Bright. I'm a third year PhD student from the Department of Nursing and Midwifery. And my presentation this evening is entitled Women Prisoners Mental Health. Now, I'd like to begin by giving an overview as to why this topic is so important. You might have heard on the radio today about the overcrowding in Irish prisons. Well, globally, since the year 2000, the rate of female incarcerations to prison has grown by approximately 60%. And it's estimated there are 744,000 women either on remand or sentenced in prison settings at any given time. Now, the World Health Organization estimates that greater than 80% of these women will have a mental health diagnosis, such as depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress or psychosis. And to compound these issues, before they come to prison, women will often experience social exclusion because of their mental health issues, but also because they come from socially deprived areas. And the crimes that they're incarcerated for are often committed in the context of trauma, vulnerability and poverty. Now, because mental health problems are overrepresented in the female prison population, I was interested to learn about how mental health problems are managed in a prison setting. So I conducted a review of the international literature on two distinct but related topics. The first, looking at the use of digital mental health interventions in a prison setting. And the second, looking at women's experiences of prison-based mental health care. And what my findings to date show is that no study exists on either topic. Now, this contributes to a concept known as epistemic oppression, whereby women in prison are persistently excluded from knowledge production. It means that nobody is asking them about their opinions or perceptions on these really important topics. And it also means that women in prison, as well as those who are working in prison settings, are largely invisible in research domains. 
Now, to begin to address this gap, I have conducted 45 interviews, 20 with prison staff and 25 with women in prison from across Ireland. And the impact of my research means that for the first time on a national and international basis, women have been asked about their experiences. And we now have a body of knowledge produced by women about their experiences of prison mental health services, but also on their perceptions of the use of digital mental health interventions. We can use this knowledge in so many ways. We can use it to deepen our own understanding of these problems. And in doing so, we can help make visible their experiences in settings such as this. But we can also use it to inform policy and service provision so that we can tailor the services available in prison to better meet the needs of this vulnerable and underrepresented population. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon. My name is Kiria Kikwebidu. I'm from the Department of Chemical Sciences, and the title of my talk is Microscopic Solutions for Macroscopic Problems. Every single one of us in this room is responsible for the greatest failure of humanity, climate change. Our carbon footprint has caused our planet to overheat. Extreme droughts, heat waves, floods and storms are projected to be felt by 2050, but in reality, these events are already happening. For most European countries, last year was the warmest year in their history. Rising sea levels are about to bring parts of Ireland underwater, while across the globe, my home country, Cyprus, is already facing water scarcity concerns. To mitigate this damage, we must shift to clean energy, remove existing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and provide clean water to those affected. But current solutions are inefficient and expensive, and we need better alternatives. One of them is the use of crystals, offering high working capacities and lower energy requirements than existing technologies. A microscopic crystal, only visible under a microscope, is a potential game changer in this area. Imagine a crystal as a set of Lego blocks, stacked in a repeating pattern in a way that leaves tiny pockets between them. These spaces can then be filled with small molecules, like carbon dioxide or water, especially if the blocks are engineered to promote strong interactions with these molecules. Much like the blocks have different colors, shapes, and sizes, the components of a crystal can be precisely customized. And that is exactly what I do in my PhD. I go into the lab, I carefully design and synthesize crystals, and evaluate their potential to store clean fuels, trap carbon dioxide, or harvest water from air. I have tested over a hundred different crystals that led me to a very exciting discovery. By changing one single atom of a crystal or one tiny portion of a Lego block, I was able to significantly improve its properties. Using this approach, I'm now optimizing these microscopic solutions to solve our global macroscopic problems. I took this photo when I went home last year, and I am committed to preserving this environment. Through my research, we could be the ones that finally leave a lasting green legacy. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Gemma McCarthy, and I'm a third year PhD student here at the Kemi Business School, looking at how to support an aging workforce through a workability lens. My research focuses on both the positives of aging and working, and it's relevant to every single person in this room here today. Let me tell you why. It's no surprise that in the Western world, our workforce is aging. Why? 
Simply put, less people are being born and therefore less people are entering the workforce. On the other side, people are living so much longer than we used to. In the 1960s, you could expect to live to, on average, 62 years of age. Nowadays, that number has jumped to around 81 years old, which is great and a huge improvement in not a long period of time. But what are the implications for that? One major implication is that it puts increasing stresses on our retirement systems. And that's where my research comes in. My PhD aims to identify ways of increasing people's workability to extend their working lives, should they choose to do so. But when we talk about work and jobs, there are so many different types of demands that people have to meet in different roles across industries. Take these two contexts, for example. In the top picture, you have people working in a really physically laborious job, doing things like lifting heavy objects, a lot of repetitive movements, involving a lot of muscular endurance. In the bottom picture, you have people working in customer service role, which involves things like identifying the needs of your customer, communicating effectively, regulating your own emotions as well as others. So how do I, as an organizational psychologist, provide recommendations to employers on how to support employees working in such different contexts? Well, that is what my PhD is focused on. My research takes into consideration the different demands that people meet in their particular role and aims to identify what specific factors lead to them being able to meet the physical, cognitive, interpersonal and emotional demands of their job. A particularly novel aspect of my research is focusing on what helps people meet the emotional demands of their job, which hasn't been looked at in previous workability literature. Ultimately, I would like to be able to provide recommendations for researchers and importantly practitioners on how to best support the employees working in their specific context. Thank you very much. Well, I'm not nervous, and now you're not seeing me, seeing me shaking, okay? So, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nolu Hudal-Hewl. I am a third-year PhD student at the School of Modern Languages and Applied Linguistics. And in today's presentation, I will talk to you about my presentation titled, Train Teachers, Don't Blame Them. So, I would love to believe that each and every person here are in favor of making education accessible equally to each and every person. But have you ever wondered what does that really mean on practical ground? Let me be more specific with my question. Do you think that there is a difference between a special needs teacher and any regular teacher? If your answer is yes, do you think that special needs teachers receive more education and training about how to include those who are struggling in comparison to regular teachers? If this is the case, what would happen if the services of special needs teachers are not available? Unfortunately, this is the case in my country. In public schools in Algeria, special needs education or special or additional needs education are not available. That's why the special needs or regular teachers are in the role of taking care of all the students' needs. That's why I wanted to investigate through my research their preparedness to include the diversity of students. But in doing so, I have given more attention to English as a foreign language teachers and dyslexic students at middle level uh, schools. You'll be wondering, why dyslexia? Why English as a foreign language? Well, a simple answer to that is because I am an English teacher and I am dyslexic. So I was thinking, why not let me benefit from my research? But actually, there is a different reason for that that I bet you didn't know. English is a dyslexic language. Look it up, because you write something and you read a completely different thing. So, in my, through my research and through my results, it appears that EFL teachers in Algeria receive good and enough education about how to teach, what to teach. They are even aware that they can come across different students with different needs. But they don't know what dyslexia is. They are not familiar with what inclusive education represents or what it doesn't mean. These teachers believe in order to be inclusive, you need to have a certain kind of knowledge with a certain kind of experience. Well, knowledge is needed and really can make a difference. But it doesn't mean that without it, you cannot be inclusive enough. You know why? Because the teaching techniques that special needs teachers use can be used by anyone, 
allowing extra time, using different senses in, in, in explaining. Anyone can do that. You know what's even better? It can benefit anyone. It's a bonus. So I, the impact of my research that I hope it would make is I would make a training programs that use this knowledge to create this awareness among these, EF, uh, among these teachers and to provide them with a pedagogical tool that can reach or uplift their, uh, their pedagogical or their rules in teaching for a better education for everyone. Thank you for listening. <laughs>
on, on the pictures. But just to say that the, the winner of uh, the 2023 Picture This uh, competition uh, with a um, title on the outside looking in, it's Siva Zulfikar. <laughs> Life is tough, but sitting in that room with the three judges is one of the most tough. I mean, I only had one sausage roll. <laughs> Anyone that knows me, I would usually have three in that space. Of time. So, so tough. Um, geez, there was virtually a point or two points between a lot of the presenters. Um, when we got to the top three, I think there's a point between two of them and a point five. Um, between another one, two. So very, very closely run. Um, again, thank you so much um, for, for the effort. Um, truly humbled. Um, and the three, I don't know if we'll ever get them back. <laughs> um, they all fought, they fought for every single presenter. Every single presenter um, got air time and, and, a, and a, fought, a fight was made for each one. Um, agreement eventually came um, and I'll, I'll do it in reverse order. So um, in third place, um, with a title um, of Women's Prisoners Mental Health, is <laughs> Anne-Marie Bright. In second place, um, with a title, Feed That Robot, The Silicon Bird. <laughs> sure I'll get the whole title out before people start to clap for the first place. Um, first place um, title, thousands of resources for a few dozen players. <laughs> the thanks. Um, first thanks to the, the, the three, um, three reviewers or judges. We have Dr Julianne Stack um, from Mary I. We have David Bennis um, from Music Performance and Catherine Hayes from the School of Journalism. Can we please show them our sincere <laughs> thanks. And if we do ask you back next, next year, you can get more than one sausage, uh, one more than one sausage roll. Um, folks, I'd also like to thank, as, as Norley said at the start, the, the, the team from the Office of the Vice President Research have put this week together uh, and the work that they have done. Um, it, it just, they've been everywhere when needed, um, so sincere thanks to that. Thank you to the Doctoral College staff um, and particularly uh, Anne O'Dwyer for, for organising um, the, the food and, and the venue and for Jer for all the work he's done. Um, in both competitions. Um, again, I'm just so humbled that this isn't really me that you're seeing now. I'm totally floored in relation to just the, the level um, of performance by everybody um, in Picture This and Thesis in Three. 
So um, if I can ask those perhaps who have uh, won, award, in fact, everybody that presented this evening and the, the picture of this, if you maybe just stay behind and we can get some uh, photos with you. And anyone else that wants to join, you're more than welcome to stay. Um, otherwise, folks, sincerely thank you for extending your day uh, and attending and uh, safe home. Thank you so much. <laughs>